Hi guys and welcome to this video. In today's video I am going to be showing you how I do this on Scylla as well as doing a tutorial for it. I've um, included a few real-time clips in here as well. The reference photo I'm using for this drawing is from Wildlife Reference Photo. They offer quite a wide range of different animals. They only charge $5 for a royalty-free image. So if you want to draw this picture yourself, you can go find it on there. In order to create a background for this piece, I am using my airbrush. And to cover up the area in which I am going to draw with color pencils, I'm using a product called Frisket. Frisket is a low-tech masking tape that can easily be removed without taking a sketch with it. I trace the outline of my subject onto the frisket and then I just apply it on top. It's transparent so you can easily see your sketch through it and apply it correctly. This way I avoid getting any of the paint on places that I don't want it to be. In this case it's on the ancillar itself and at the tree trunk on the bottom of the drawing. To ensure that the background is looking kind of out of focus, I made sure not to create any harsh lines and I'm going over the areas with a cool grey. In general, cool tones pushes things back and warm tones pushes things forward, so going over the area with a cool grey sort of distances it. And I warmed up certain areas where I would bring in some burnt umber. I'm using a stencil to create a soft bouquet effect. I make um, the different circles in various amounts of saturation and I also try to randomly mix sizes. Some of the circles are overlapping as to create some dimension in the background itself. The airbrush that I am using is an Ivata Neo, I hope that's how you say it. On the foreground, I want to apply color pencil on top of the airbrush area. I keep this area dark and then I just added a bit of texture using a stencil. In general, with airbrushes, stencils come in handy. Um, they can help you achieve different texture and sharp lines, which is otherwise difficult. Using an airbrush to create a background like this helps me achieve a smooth and even lay down on the paper very, very fast. This background took me around 45 minutes. If I had to do it in color pencil, it would have been far more. Next, I am moving on to the eyes. I always start with the eyes as I want them to be just right. I start out by using a dark sepia to outline the eye itself as well as the pupil. Then I lightly cover the eye with a light blue and earth green. I bring in some of the colors of the background using Bistro and Burnt Sienna. The upper eyelid is casting a shadow down on the eye itself, in which I bring in a lot of warm grays and some browns. On the edges of the eyes, I am using turquoise and dark indigo to add in some details. I draw around highlighted areas only shading them lightly with blue tones. Once I've covered the paper with my first layer, I blend with odorless mineral spirit. I am being very careful not to blend the dark sepia into the color of the eyes itself, as this will make the colors appear muddy. As that is just drying up, I begin to work on the nose of the ancilla. Again, I'm using a dark sepia and I slightly map out the nose itself. This is just to get a feel of how it's actually shaped. I shade in the dark areas using some cool grays, violets and browns. I keep the cool grays on top of the nose as this is where the light is hitting. In the pink part of the nose I am using peachy, violet, purple and magenta colors. I shade in the darker parts with Caput Mortem lighter areas I use some very vibrant colors in. When drawing something like this, it's very important that you keep looking at your reference photo. The anatomy of the Ancilla's nose is very different from any of the animals I usually draw, so I had to keep a very close eye on my reference as I was drawing. 
I tried to see it as a 3D image in my head in order to figure out how the shaded areas actually looked and worked. When blending, I was careful not to mix the darker gray area in with the pink of the nose. When you have an area that is as vibrant as this, it's important that you keep it clean. It's very easy for it to become muddy and flat, so be aware of that. Once the paint thinner on the eyes have dried up, I apply the second layer. Here I begin to add in a lot more details. I'm using walnut brown, some bright greens, as well as turquoise and dark indigo for this. I warm up some areas using a warm yellowy green tone, then I'm just slightly glazing on top. I focus on getting my values correct, more than the colors itself. I need my darker areas to be dark enough and my lights to be light enough as to create contrast. In my reference photo, the eye is only cool toned, but I want it to tie in better with the warmer background I had chosen, so that's why I'm warming some areas up. I'm being very careful as not to draw in my highlighted areas. When adding in details, look at the reference photo and don't get impatient. It takes time. Don't just make random scribbly lines as that will appear unrealistic. Especially in cat eyes, people have a tendency to just make lines that go from the pupil out towards the outer corners of the eyes, instead of actually looking at the details in the reference photo and making it appear similar. I try to keep my pencils very sharp at all times. This will help the pigment easier lay down onto the paper in an even and precise manner. I used to be very careful not to sharpen my pencil too much, as I felt it was quite wasteful. However, I think my art actually improved immensely by beginning to sharpen them more often. Now it's time for the ears. I begin by drawing the inside of the ear, the skin part. Be careful not to make this area too pink or red. I'm using colors like Bistra, Flesh, various purples and flesh tone pinks. I also included a bit of light blue in order to tone down some area. I try to keep the colors light where white hairs are going to be. This way the white will be able to show up more and then I'm just drawing around the white hairs to make them stand out. If there is a lot of hairs, like in the right ear, I draw around the area completely in my first layer and then later I add in more color and detail. As I'm working, I keep erasing the sketch with my eraser. Especially in light areas, the graphite will easily show through and it will create these muddy grey looking areas where, as it blends with colored pencil and you can't go back and erase that. I move my pencils in small circular motion as this creates a smooth and even area of color instead of lines. If you're drawing in scribbly lines, it will show through. When drawing the fur itself, I try to map out the direction of the fur as well as the darker areas. I try to use blues and violets inside black spots as this will make the black appear even darker than if you just use black alone. If you're using black alone, the area can look kind of flat. In my first layer, I am just building up the colors as well as mapping out dark and light areas, fur length and fur direction. In the tan areas, I'm using a lot of creamy colors. I try to stay away from yellows as these often tend to look overpowering, unrealistic and quite harsh instead of soft and realistic. My pencil strokes, I keep the same length as the fur and the same direction I wanted. And also I'm careful to make the fur strokes bend and not straight. And even though I'm going to blend, it will show through if you're not doing this. Um, so do this already on your first layer or move in small circular motions. In general, I'm just trying to get base color down and not too much detail. For the white fur around the edges of the ears, I'm using a mixture of cool and warm light grays, just to map out the direction and the length of the fur. I try to keep the white areas white for now. Especially here on the nose and forehead of the ancilla, it's quite important that I keep track of my reference photo. Especially cats have very very short hairs on their nose and it's moving in all kinds of crazy directions. And if you just make a lot of random lines, it's not going to look right. 
A problem that I have is I always struggle with determining how dark or light my lighter area should be. So I never finish them before the end. This helped me to better judge my values when I have the rest of my drawing to compare it to. It's easier to judge if an area is way too light when you have the rest of the tan and dark areas in. I want to be sure that the Odeless Mineral Spirit is completely dried off before I go ahead and work on an area. So that's why I'm jumping around quite a lot. If the Mineral Spirit haven't dried off completely, you can risk flattening the texture of the paper. Now it's time for the tree trunk lying in the bottom of the picture. To begin with, I used a lot of warm greys. In a few highlighted areas, I used some cool greys. And then I used a lot of greens that were cool toned uh, or greyish green colors. And here my um, Derwent drawing pencils really came in handy as they have a beautiful shade uh, range in these natural earthy colors. I used a dark sepia as well as some dark grays to line out these um, ridges that were in the tree trunk. And then I just added detail using Bistro, Volner Brown, uh, Nougat from Polychromos and some very vibrant greens. I am by no means an expert on drawing wood textures, I've done it two times before, but what I try to do is I try to look at the reference photo, I cannot say that enough, but I try to look at it and I try to break it into smaller segments. As you can see, I tackled smaller areas at a time and now I felt confident enough to just do the rest of the trunk in one sitting. When you think of a tree, you typically think of brown, but you have to be wary of not using a very, very vibrant uh, brown that is more towards the red orange side, but instead use a more cool toned uh, brown that's also more towards the gray specter. Um, and when it comes to the green, I used a very warm green, um, not some bluish greens, and again, greens that leaned a bit more towards the gray side. Would have a lot of texture, so I tried to implementing that by adding small lines that followed the grain of the wood, as well as small dots, small circular points and areas that matched up with the light uh, direction in my reference photo. So you have to be wary of that, um, actually analyzing where is shadow being cast and what is it being cast from. I think the important part is keeping a natural flow and a natural look in the texture that you're adding. So for instance, these lines in the grain should be um, curved various amounts and in various uh, directions. So they appear a bit random, but still natural. The back part that I'm drawing here um, is slightly out of focus. And how you achieve that effect is basically by not having details. You don't want any sharp lines, any defined areas that are very crisp. So I very loosely sketch in circles and have a lot of gradients, a lot of overlapping colors, so that I won't have any sharp edges or any uh, sharp transitions. It has to be very smooth and very soft looking. I'm also being careful when using colors not to use um, the boldest contrast, but, but just sort of tone things down just a bit to make it seem further distance. And there on the real time clip, you could see how I was moving my pencil in these circular motions um, and very lightly as to create this sort of blurred out effect. Here I don't bother a lot whether my pencils are sharp or not. I try to use the side of the pencils actually to, to draw in larger areas at a time. And when it comes to drawing the fur, I still want it to look like fur, but I don't want to have individual strands. So instead I go in and I define the, the different clumps of fur and, and sort of divide it into different clusters. And now I just lightly map out where the spots are going to be. I am careful again not to only use black. Um, in the white parts of the fur I'm using a lot of blue tones in the black areas. And in the more tan areas I'm using a lot of violets. And this is to make the black a bit more intense and to give it some more contrast. But yeah, I just slowly map it out so that I know where it is, um, because then I can erase my pencil sketch as I go along. 
and then I began working on the white fur and here I use a light warm grey or light cool grey uh, and also some olive brown from Luminance just to slightly map out the direction of the fur as well as the length and sort of divide it into these clumps. Um, it, it's all about building up the layers slowly when it's white because you can't really go back and make an area lighter again, at least not very much. So therefore you have to be quite careful and slowly keep adding layers. In general when you're drawing white fur, you have to remember that the fur is not actually white. It is reflecting a lot of the colors that is around it. So here I'm bringing in a lot of warm tones from the background and from the tan areas of the insula, but also some blues and cool greys from the sky. Um, in general, try to put in a bit of color as this will help to make the animal look alive and young. Um, if you just use greys alone, it's going to look quite old. The way I'm working around this with drawing the spots in first, I have to be very careful when I'm blending with the paint thinner as not to drag any of the pigments into the white areas. I like the fact that you can move the pigments a little bit with the uh, paint thinner but you have to be very careful if you drag too much pigment into white areas it's going to be impossible to get white again. And here is where you can really see what I meant uh, when I said that I was using blue tones in white fur and then more purple violet in the tan areas. You can, <laughs> you can almost see when the, without me actually having drawn in the tan areas where they're going to end. And I'm just slowly mapping out the fur on the white part on the chest and once I'm done with that I begin to blend a bit. And once the paint thinner has dried, I return back again with a much sharper pencil to add in the details of the fur. I am using a lot of walnut brown and dark sepia as well as my black pencil to build up the fur in this area. So here I just begin to slowly map out the fur as well as adding details and direction to the spots on the leg. I really like using my polychromos for details, they hold their point really really well and sharpen so nicely. The luminance on the other hand I feel like doesn't hold their point just as fine and therefore in my opinion doesn't um, as easily achieve fine details as the polychromos. Instead they look really really soft so I often use them to, to soften up areas and to add fine details on top of especially dark areas as they are very opaque um, and they are really great for when you have areas that looks just a bit too gritty or too harsh they can really really soften it up and make it look like well fur. This part here I've sped up quite a bit as it's just me mapping out the spots as well as putting on a base layer of color. For this I am using many of my Durbin drawing pencils that I have created a review on and I'll leave a link down below so that you can go and watch that. But basically they blend so beautifully and that makes them just perfect for creating base layers. They, they blend out very easily so you can actually sort of scribble the colors on and they lay down really really quickly because of this. So I use them a lot for base layers and they have the most beautiful earthy um, natural tone colors so that went perfectly with the colors that I needed for this Ancilla. And the Ivory Black from that series of pencils is just one of my absolute favorites ever. It's just such a dark and rich color and it's really intense to look at. That's why I didn't use it in my base layer but only putting it on here on second layer because it's just very dark. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's one of my absolute top favorite pencils. As you can probably tell by now, I am the type of person who jumps around a lot when I'm drawing. I didn't used to do this, it's something that's come with experience and if you are a beginner or new at drawing, 
I recommend starting with smaller segments and then finishing them because it is easy to get lost in the bigger picture when you're jumping around a lot like I am. Something that I've been asked quite a few times is how do I keep up my motivation for finishing these larger time-consuming drawings? And something that I do is I make small goals that are rather easy to achieve rather than, oh, I want to draw this big realistic drawing. So for instance, I wanted to finish the eyes first. That's always my first goal because that's something that really makes the drawing stand out. But the point is to create certain timestamps at where I'll feel a fulfilling of achieving a goal. It can also be like, today I want to sit down and draw for at least half an hour. And here, when drawing the paw, I'm really taking notice of the fur length and direction on my reference photo, as it's kind of um, poking in all kinds of different directions, and it's very, very short. And that was especially important as well as I was drawing the spots, because they are scattered throughout the leg, but the fur direction actually changes um, towards the ground as the fur will pour point more downwards and on the top of the leg it will point towards the paw or upwards. To get the color just right on the leg I used glazing a lot. Um, I used uh, terracotta and cinnamon from Polychromos as well as some warm grays. And what I do is I just lightly lightly touch the paper with the side of the pencil and then just barely touch the paper as I move it across and this will just lightly lightly stain the paper with the color just like when you're glazing with oils or acrylics. The total drawing time for this uh, drawing is right around the 20 hour mark and that's including the background and the paper is just a tad larger than A3. So that should give you an idea of how much real time I've spent creating this drawing. And at this point, I'm just adding in a lot of the fur details, uh, slowly just building up the areas that wasn't done or was lacking detail or that I felt could use just a bit more of uh, a pop of color and then as the final touch I added in the whiskers. I didn't record this but I used a black polychromos as well as a brush and pencils product titanium white mixed with the touch up texture um, to paint on the white whiskers. And now all that's left is just to put on my signature. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. It was so fun to make, but also a whole lot of work. Anyways, if you have any questions, as always, just leave them down below. And otherwise, thanks for watching.